Welcome to the Walled Garden Podcast. Here, we nourish the gardens of our minds, one meaningful conversation at a time. If you'd like to find out more, go to thewalledgarden.com. Thanks for joining us. Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Walled Garden Podcast. So before I dive in and introduce today's conversation, today's guest, I I really want to let you know that we have some exciting events coming up this week in the Walled Garden. So firstly, we have Dr. Mark Vernon coming in to talk to us about Stoicism, Christianity, and the spiritual path of Dante's Divine Comedy. So that's going to be an extremely interesting, captivating meetup that we're having there. That's going to be on the 2nd of April. So you can head to thewalledgarden.com forward slash events and you can find us there uh, with all of the events and the links to where you can register for those. We'd love to see you there. And then the second meetup that we have this week is this coming Sunday for us Australians. And that's where myself and uh, Judith Stove, one of our members and uh, and also somebody who is contributing to the Walled Garden in, in a very big way, uh, she is going to be talking with me about Seneca's letter number 39 on noble aspirations. So we'd love to see you there for that soul searching with Seneca meetup. These are really great meetups where we really just break down each letter and see if we can suck the marrow from Seneca's words. You know, he's such a wise philosopher and there's so much that we have already gained uh, from his writings. So thank you to everybody who came to last week's Soul Searching with Seneca meetup. It was such a great time, uh, just really great conversation. Uh, And actually the theme was on quiet conversation. That's one of his previous letters, letter number 38. And so it was beautiful to discuss this idea that, you know, really what we're trying to do in the World Garden is to open up spaces for us to build connections around the world with people who want to have those beautiful conversations about these extremely meaningful topics that pertain to us being able to live a flourishing life. So uh, it was it was quite a uh, an appropriate topic uh, for what we're trying to do here in the World Garden. Nonetheless, Head over there to thewalledgarden.com forward slash events and you can see the rest of the events that we have coming up in the month of April and we'd love to see you at any of those and you can register via that page. So moving on, we have today a conversation between Kai Whiting, myself and our guest, Jonathan Church. Now, this is actually a conversation that Kai initiated because he wanted to talk about stoicism as it pertains to free speech and all issues related with that hefty topic. And so this was one of our Walled Garden live meetup and Q&As, uh, and it was so much fun to have a whole bunch of people there to discuss this topic. So remember that if you are a member of the Walled Garden, then when you're logged into the website, you can get that full conversation and Q&A right there on the page uh, where you'll actually find this episode as well. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Jonathan Church, and that'll give you a bit of an idea for uh, why we wanted to have him along to talk about free speech. Uh, And then we'll just dive straight into the conversation. So Jonathan Church is an economist with two decades of experience working in the private and public sectors. His professional background is in antitrust, intellectual property, valuation, inflation, index number theory, statistics, and finance. In 2016, he began writing a weekly column for The Good Men Project, with a focus on current affairs, social justice, and masculinity. In 2018, he was diagnosed with a low-grade brain tumour, which led not only to brain surgery and radiation, but also to a decision to pursue his passion for writing and scholarship without restraint. Outside of his day job and time with his daughter, he spends most of his remaining time as an independent scholar writing on economics, finance, and social justice. He's been published in Quillette, Aero Magazine, Arc Digital, The Agonist Journal, Marion West, The Good Men Project, Culture Rico, New Discourses, The Washington Examiner, The Daily Stoic, and The Federalist. He's also published poetry in Lummox, Big Hammer, and Street Value, as well as short stories in Vending Machine Press and The Agonist Journal. 
He graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a Bachelor in Economics and Philosophy and from Cornell University with a Master's in Economics. He is also a CFA charter holder. Any time left over is spent exercising and playing chess. Okay, so with that all said, I hope you're excited for this conversation. Uh, we we really got into the weeds. It was a great conversation to have and and I think that we took it in a whole bunch of different directions, but nonetheless, really focusing on that question of, you know, what are the bounds of free speech and especially with that kind of stoic tilt to it. So I'm not going to hold you up any longer. Without any further ado, I want to present to you Jonathan Church, Kai Whiting and myself speaking on Stoicism and free speech. Enjoy. Yeah, so I met I met Jonathan just, bec- for just because, because of something he wrote. He wrote, I don't want to actually, I'll let Jonathan say what he wrote. He wrote a particular piece that just you know, grabbed me by the shirt or the Christmas jumper and uh, pulled me in. And I was like, I need to speak to this guy. And so I decided that's what I was going to do. But more than just speak to him, I wanted to work with him. I mean, we're, we're not necessarily, you know, when, when people see like Jonathan and I working or sitting together, we, it may not become apparent that we're incredibly friendly towards each other. I don't think we necessarily are. But we have this very sort of strong sense of justice, strong sense of self, a strong sense of using emotions appropriately. To not be emotionless, but not nor be full of emotion, at least in public, right? We all have our moments. I'm not saying that Jonathan and I don't have our moments. We must do. We're human beings. Um, we're human beings. So Jonathan just did that for me. And I wanted to work with him because he thinks very differently to me. Like on, no, not core values, we're very similar, but he thinks very differently. And his approach to writing is very different. So Jonathan, do you want to tell people what that article was? Because again, the power of words, I just can't do it justice. So Jonathan, if you could share the article, talk about the article that really pulled me in and brought me to your attention and Ryan Holiday's attention as well. It wasn't just me. Okay, so it's that one. I was, I was, uh, I was ninety percent sure I knew which article you're referring to, but I wasn't entirely sure because I've written a lot in, in recent years. But I assume it's the brain cancer article for Quillette, uh, which is published by an Australian native, uh, uh, Clara, Lina, Clara, Clara Lehman. Um, but yeah, essentially, uh, it was just. Um, uh, an article that I wrote in reaction to uh, APA guidelines that had been released in January 2019, uh, the American. So can you Soci- say what APA? Yeah, yeah the American, American Soci- Psychological Association, Psychology. and uh, they had written a set of guidelines um, challenge, challenging uh, people to rethink uh, what they call traditional masculinity, uh, which sort of very basically overlaps with what is called in what you. I guess we think of as the culture wars, um, toxic masculinity. Um, And it was essentially kind of um, uh, uh, encouraging us to rethink it in terms of um, what many people, including myself, have come to be called to call critical social justice um, thinking or ideology or what have you. And, you know, the basic idea is social constructionism, that masculinity is a social construct and so on. At any rate, uh, one of the things that they mentioned in the guidelines um, is that there were some aspects of traditional masculinity um, that they thought were harmful to the uh, uh, mental, physical, I I guess, physical health of men, which is things like aggressiveness, competitiveness. And then they mentioned stoicism. Um, Now, they did have in mind lowercase stoicism and not exactly uh, uppercase philosophical stoicism. But I thought that in not explicitly distinguishing between the two, um, then they, they failed to sort of, uh, uh, in, in not being able to make that distinction, it sort of reinforces uh, a layman's understanding of stoicism. Because for me, I had been diagnosed with uh, brain cancer about a year ago, a year before that, 2018. I had a brain tumor. Um, 
so not a glioblastoma. So I'm not like about to die, but I did have a tumor. And um, I remember, you know, when I first learned the news, I got the call from the neurologist the, 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 the morning of uh, uh, an MRI, which was part, a series, part of a series of tests that I've been taking for a few months because I had gone into the hospital a few months before that. They diagnosed it as an old stroke, and then they couldn't figure out why it was a stroke when I was perfectly healthy. And so all sorts of tests, nobody could figure it out. And then I got an MRI, and it was finally determined it was a brain tumor. And my first reaction was to the neurologist, was I just simply said very stoically, uh, congratulations. In other words, she had figured it out. And I remember that I hadn't really felt any great shock. Uh, it was just something, it was just a piece of news that then I would process appropriately. And then, so you could say it was very stoic. Um, and then a year later, uh, these APA guidelines came out and identify stoicism as something that's very harmful to men. And I was thinking, well, stoicism actually, if you, if you, if you draw the distinction between lowercase and uppercase stoicism, then you can recognize that there is something called stoicism, the philosophy, which is actually very helpful to mental health in sort of dealing with themes like uh, mortality, um, you know, the shock of news that you have a brain tumor and so on. So I just decided to write an article about it. And the uh, title of the article was how my quote unquote toxic stoicism helped me cope with, uh, with brain cancer. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially I, I was sort of following along the line of thinking that I had been developing in a series of articles, uh, which was developing a serious critique of what, you know, again, what I've called critical social justice ideology. Har happy to talk about that, although we probably want to stay focused on stoicism. Um, but I thought, you know, I've had a, an interaction with Donald Robinson on this through email, and, and he he was pretty explicit that they were, what they're talking about is lower case stoicism. And, and of course I acknowledge that, but I thought that it was problematic not to actually explicitly draw the distinction between lower case and upper case stoicism, because then you just basically for, further reinforce the notion of stoic as you know mentally unhealthy. So I wrote an article essentially talking about that um, and saying that you know stoicism is actually a good thing. And that uh, the the APA maybe was mistaken in uh, in talking about stoicism as a um, as a uh, harmful aspect of what they call traditional masculinity. And apparently, uh, Kai was struck by the article. Um, I guess it was it had a sort of tone of a measured tone, the kind of temperance, I guess, if you will, that we try to cultivate in Stoic philosophy. Um, Ryan Holiday picked up on it because he likes to read Quillette, and so I was on his podcast um, about a year ago, maybe. Uh, but at any rate, that that's that's essentially what that was about. Um, I thought Kai that you had also seen me on that um, uh, podcast um, with Counterweight, but uh, at any rate, that, yeah, that's, that's how I wanted I, to. Yeah, that was how I wanted to meet you as well. But how I wanted to work with you was with. So I should have distinguished. So I first come across you in the in the podcast, you're right? And but to really sit down and work with you, that was through the through the article because it was it was something that was so powerful, right? Again, the power of words. It is so rare that it wasn't just a sentence that I thought of like, yeah, that really resonates. The whole bloody article was like in my face like if you want to you know if you're calling yourself a stoic or you identify with stoic principles try having brain cancer and, and then try I should, to respond back I, I should add amazing. to that yeah I should add to that um the basic distinction I I drew in that was between a re emotional repression and re emotional restraint uh Donald Robertson has a bit of a problem with that distinction he doesn't I think that he says a lot of psychotherapists would not see a distinction um, and I take that uh, to heart. I, I mean, I understand what he's saying. And I think he, he's correct that a lot of psychotherapists would maybe not see that, but I would disagree with them. And the reason I would say that is I'm thinking about how Stoics view emotion, you know, like Margaret Graver and, St Graver and Stoicism and uh, emotion. I, and I'm going to botch this, but she talks about what it is to feel afraid and what it is to be afraid. And the idea being that with Stoics, you're essentially taking a pause to evaluate what the emotions 
mean for you and how to cultivate the correct or the healthy judgment about that emotion. And so when I say emotional restraint, I'm not really saying that I reject emotion or that I'm trying to repress it, but rather to uh, restrain the initial visceral, as Simon used, the word Simon used in uh, talking about his poem, um, in terms of the reactions to the poem, um, to restrain that initial visceral reaction, take a pause to evaluate the emotion, not to repress it. And so that was a distinction I drew, I drew between the, in the essay, and I still abide by that distinction, um, <laughs> even if Donald takes issue with it, but, but I, I appreciate what he's trying to say. Um, but that, that's basically the distinction I was drawing in that article. So my first question to you, Jonathan, uh, is for, for men in particular, why is free speech an important aspect of civilized society? For men in particular, I will ask you a different question about women, but why for men in particular might it be? Considering what you've just said about being stoic and you know being emotionless, and I would say one way to express one's emotion is through speech, why would you say for men in particular, potentially uh, free speech is important to a civilized society? Well, I, you know, my initial reaction is I don't know that there's anything that stands out to me that's specific to men. Um, it seems to me that free speech is just something that um, is important to any of us as rational creatures, as having the capacity to think through a problem, um, to think through a question that we have about life, uh, about nature being around us, sitting in the uh, park like Simon was writing a poem. I mean, essentially, we want to express something that we are thinking about the world around. So I, I don't know that there's offhand, I can't think of anything that's specific to men, um, unless I guess this issue, this example that was raised in the article um, in addressing these guidelines that were about traditional masculinity. And, and so I guess um, it was important to, for me at least, to, uh, uh, issue a critique of um, their identification of stoicism as an, as a harmful aspect of traditional masculinity. And I suppose that fits in to um, uh, the specificity of men, your question, in the context of my uh, more general concern with critical social justice uh, ideology. And if I can try to summarize that in a sentence or two, the issue is that um, relationships, the way we think, our identities, um, how we live our lives uh, are largely socially constructed. And so that as men, um, there's not something that's uh, universally essentially true about being a man, but that it is a function of the social culture or society in which we are embedded in a set of norms and habits and ideas and discourses that make up that social construction. And I don't take, you know, I don't necessarily think that's all wrong. I, I, I think that there's obviously, and there's obviously um, a lot uh, to be gained from exploring the ways in which society shapes us and socializes us and so on. But I also think that uh, there is something that is universal about being human, namely cat rationality, um, you know, the sort of stoic virtues and that sort of thing, just as an example. Um, and so in this, in this particular case, as a man talking about guidelines that were issued critiquing traditional masculinity, I guess it was just important for me to exercise, quote unquote, a right of spe free speech to um, engage in rational critique. But I don't see it necessarily, I mean, just to bring it back to stoicism, I don't see it as gender specific. At least Absolutely offhand, not. maybe I might think about it later and think, think I should have had a different answer, but that's my initial reaction. The, re the reason why I asked you specifically about that is because at the moment, it seems to be that if you form, if you form into the category of a certain type of male, 
you're you're able to be silenced right it's it's okay to say to a certain category of person that they should speak or That's they it. shouldn't speak about something and as i said recently whilst it may be true that white straight men on aggregate do better in the western world it doesn't That's follow it. that an individual white male does better than everybody else it just okay i see where you're going with that question now so what would uh, yeah, you say so I, in response? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, so how do I say? Uh, there is a view, um, and, and this is sort of coming out of uh, critical social justice uh, ideology, if you will. Uh, again, this is what I call it. I, I, I write a lot about it in this upcoming book I have published, um, that you should stand aside in, a, say, a classroom or something, um, or in really any context, um, uh, in attempting to say something about about a, an aspect of reality that doesn't really relate directly to quote unquote white maleness, um, you might say something like standpoint epistemology, uh, which is the idea that knowledge is situated within sort of gender identity, racial identity, or what have you. Um, and so there is a sort of epistemic advantage that someone with lived experience of a woman or a person of color or whatever uh, has in speaking to some aspect of reality that is more more likely to be experienced by uh, you know a woman or a person of color and so on and so therefore someone who is situated quote unquote as a white male um, really has no business speaking up about such things um, so what I would say about that is I disagree uh, in the sense that. Um, I would acknowledge or um, uh, there's a word, it's an easy word, I'm, it's escaping me, but um, uh, concede that to a large degree, there is an epistemic advantage, say, to someone who has, quote unquote, lived experience as a person of color uh, experiencing racial discrimination or a woman uh, experiencing sexual discrimination, gender discrimination, um, uh, you know, uh, in a sort of what we might call a patriarchal society, um, that they are closer to the experience, quote unquote. But I don't think that makes it inaccessible to, say, a white male, as you're saying. And that the epistemic advantage is a venue or a, a, a way in which someone with that experience can enlighten us, if you will, the white male, if you will, to some of those aspects of that experience. Um, but it would seem to be a bad argument to say that only women or people of color or whatever can experience that and understand it because of their situation and the situatedness. In other words, as rational creatures, which we all are, we can communicate this experience in a way that is universally comprehensible. And it, once we can reach common ground in our understanding about such experience, um, I think it's perfectly access, 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 acceptable for say you or me, white men, to attempt to think about how we might try to address that matter. And I think it's also accessible to, and this is I suppose the more controversial step, um, to also have to be somewhat skeptical um, or to express skepticism or just doubts or questions um, about what you might infer from lived experience of other people. I mean, in other words, I mean, the perfect example of this is microaggressions, but we could talk about that. Um, and I, 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 I am very skeptical of the paradigm of microaggressions. And I think that um, maybe that's where we want to anchor that the, the answer to your question, which is that uh, if, if people aren't familiar with this neuron, the, the notion is it was it was coined by a guy named Chester Pierce in the 1970s um, and more port pertinent there. But it's like constant put downs, uh, you know, of racial minorities that are, have, you know, psychological uh, harmful effects. And definitely I can see that being the case in the 70s. In 2007, it was another paper came out by Daryl Ring Sue, Sue 
Um, he was on a plane lot ride with a, with a friend. The uh, airline attendant asked him if they could sit in the back because it balances out the weight, the weight of the plane. It was a small hopper from New York to Boston. And he thought that that was, you know, a microaggression. It was, it was an insensitivity to him as a person of color. Um, and I think it's perfectly accessible, accept, acceptable for someone like say me or you to say, take issue with that interpretation and to say, no, that actually wasn't a microaggression. And so I think in that sense, free speech becomes very important for a man. Thank you. Because I, I mean, I was, yeah, it was a hard question. It's hard, it's hard answer, isn't it? Because there is, there is that view that just because you form part of a category, I mean, you can be assigned a category that you don't belong to. You could be, people could assume you're a straight white man and you may not well be a straight white man. So it's quite interesting that you, know, you have these categories and these categorizations of people. But I think this is where we have worked together and saying stoicism calls us to recognize is what you said in your first question, that rationality is open to all. The irony now is that people are saying the opposite, like, in some respects, men can white straight men cannot be rational creatures. We must educate them. They're not able to, you know, see a, somebody else's lived experience and go, well, whilst I have never lived through that, I, I can, because I have reason, because I have the logos within me, acknowledge and understand on a very human level how this might affect you or how it might make you feel. And that doesn't mean that I don't listen, right? Because there are, you know, I'm not saying that. You know, no, no man, quote unquote, mansplains anything. But I think a lot of people are just using these terminologies to actually silence individuals, which is which is interesting because you're not actually um, subverting the hierarchy in the way that people. Oh, I'm subverting the hierarchy. No, you're just playing the same game to your advantage, which you're just actually appealing to how hierarchies get formed. I do think that stoicism is powerful because it does appeal to reason, which we'll then go into the other fallacy that logic and reason is something that's associated with whiteness. And again, something else, no way to shut down what might otherwise be a rational discussion. Could you comment on this? Firstly, what is whiteness as a concept within critical race theory? And we better define critical race theory because I don't know if everybody would know that either, if you can do that in a very sort of elevator pitch. But you know, if I say, well, be reasonable, be rational, we have the logos inside of us, I can see that somebody might say, even if I were not white, that I'm just still occupying a space of whiteness, even like David Chappelle was accused of occupying whiteness. So could you tell us what you respond to that from a stoic perspective when somebody does say to you, oh, well, reason is a white, this issue? That you want, well, what do you want me to do? Define critical race theory or answer what, when, what happens when somebody says reason is a white, uh, yeah, discourse, well, firstly, or? that's the critic, yeah, but I think, uh, well, the latter one is more important, and then, the yeah, so, um, my short answer to that question is no, it's not, um, that uh, reason and rationality really doesn't have anything to do with, um, racial identity, uh, I think, um, as, as you stated the question, and I suppose there are a lot of, there are, you can find uh, many instances in casual discussion and carefully stated, I mean, I wanna be fair to the literature and, and the critical race theory, critical whiteness studies, the latter being where your question is really coming from. Um, there is a uh, very thoughtful scholarship that, you know, you have to handle, you have to study and be, you know, carefully and you can glean insights from that. And a large part of the problems that arise are in the way it gets talked about in casual conversation and its, in its practice. And so one of the ways it happens is when you have people saying things like rationality is just a construct of whiteness. And that becomes very problematic. And I think that the real criticism of or the real point in critical whiteness studies or critical race theory, which are both and ultimately derivative of critical theory, um, critical race theory, more specifically with critical legal studies, um, is that there is a kind of underlying uh, suspicion, maybe not suspicion, but awareness that reason alone um, does not always serve us well. 
uh, because it can reflect dominant interests. And one way to think about that is to distinguish between what's called objective reason and instrumental reason. This comes out of the Frankfurt School. An objective reason is essentially using reason to evaluate you know, your ends, what it is that you're trying to do, why you're doing it, the object of your ends, what's the value in what you are pursuing. An instrumental reason is just the idea that you're just trying to figure out how to get something. You know, you're trying to develop the best means to attain it. And the, um, there was a Frankfurt School uh, critical theorist, the founding critical theorist, Max Horkheimer, who writes a book or wrote a book called The Eclipse of Reason. And the idea is that instrumental reason eclipses objective reason. And I can, in, in a stoic context, I would think of objective reason as uh, the way we sort of think about reason, which is understanding the world around us, understanding ourselves as rational beings, trying to build our character, trying to figure out the virtuous cost, course of action. Um, and the notion of instrumental reason, which is just focused on means and not ends, um, essentially just uh, puts an end. It just, it, it distracts us from uh, thinking about the ends that we pursue. Now, how to bring that back to critical race theory and critical whiteness theory and so on, is that CRT and CWS, we'll just call it that for short, is ultimately very concerned with systems of power. That's where white privilege comes from and, and, and these other types of notions, is that power is manifest through discourses, the way we talks about, talk about reality, this social construction of reality through discourse and language. It's concerned with institutional, um, sclerat sclerotic institutional structures that sort of embed these power structures. And if you think about critical legal studies, uh, there was this distinction between legal formalism and legal realism. And formalism was the idea that uh, all we need to do is judge in very neutral terms. I mean, I'm putting, you know, saying this in shorthand, I'm sure CLS scholars would want to flesh out all of the nuances, but the idea being that you just can develop rational, neutral rules that can arbitrate disputes towards the end of justice. And the idea with critical legal studies, critical race theory, critical whiteness studies, and so on, is that there is no guarantee that you can have neutral, rational rules. And so you have legal realism, which is about the way that reason is not sufficient and maybe can even undermine the pursuit of justice in law through the ways that systems of power get embedded in institutions, uh, largely through discourse. And there's a huge, huge paper by like 140 page paper by Gar Gary Peller, the Georgetown Law Center, Metaphysics of American Law. And you wanna get a sense of what uh, they mean by, you know, the ways in which discourse can undermine, you know, the administration of law and the pursuit of justice through mass rational means, that's it. So to, to, to recapitulate, what we're talking about in terms of critical race theory, critical whiteness studies, critical theory, critical legal studies, so on, all these various branches, are systems of power that are manifest through social practices and social discourses. And the idea that reason is not by itself sufficient to ensure the pursuit of justice within the administrative apparatus of our institutions. I mean, it's very powerful. I was, I was, and I, being a Spanish and Portuguese speaker, when people talk about white, like in the in the in particularly American sense, it's like that one one drop of blood theory. That one drop of blood makes you black. There's a very UK US kind of 
concept, whereas in Latin America, that's not the case. So it's just very interesting, again, that this the way that you think about race is structured by the way you think in general and the way that that language is passed down. So if I was to play devil's advocate, I would then say to you, well, therefore, we should restrict speech, right? Because speech is dangerous, right? If speech is dangerous, you know, you you use it to say, for example, that one drop of certain blood makes you a certain type. And if we had a Spanish you know, mindset and language, we wouldn't think that way. So maybe we should just ban certain language, just, just not tasteful, that's just tasteless. What would you say to that from a stoic perspective? Um, the, the idea of banning speech because it's harmful? Yeah. It's yeah. If I is that know, just it, the based idea? on yeah, based on your argument, you know, if I'm playing devil's advocate, I mean, you know yeah. my position, but if I'm playing devil's yeah. advocate, speech can be dangerous. So why don't we just ban it? Yeah. Why so so that? what? Well, so there's two things. Um, what I was just talking about um, is not necessarily uh, the notion that words are violence, right? That's the second thing I'll talk about. Uh, but what I'm what I was talking about in terms of so this is where you have to you know you kind of go back go go back and read people like Heidegger and then Derrida and Foucault and all that just very very abstruse philosophy, um, but the idea with Derrida um, or or Foucault is that discourse is function is power and it's not that we say things that are harmful directly to people that can be harmful but that they reinforce practices that we engage in that essentially reinforce hierarchy. And so it's not that the words themselves, you know, enact a violent act, it's just that they reinforce ways of thinking that keep systems of power in place. And Foucault would talk about that in medicine, he would talk about that in sexual practices, he was talking about that in um, prison, the, the famous panop panopticon. Um, and Derrida would talk about it in terms of presence and absence and so on. But um, so uh, just, I wanted to clarify that. Um, and I think in that sense, free speech isn't a problem, uh, either for critical theorists or critics of critical theorists, because both are talking about the way in which language either does or does not enact power and privilege. The second th thing though that uh, does come up, which I, I do think is pertinent to these controversies that arise is the idea that words are violence. And <clears throat> I'm generally of the view that words by themselves per se are not violence. And uh, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianev in their book, uh, Coddling of the American Mind, uh, I think they develop a nice little syllogism to, and to illustrate why not. And the idea is that you can say something that creates set stress, and they're actually piggybacking on uh, what somebody else said as to why words are violence. And the, the argument is that you can say something that causes stress. And then when you feel stress, that can lead to harmful uh, effects psychologically, or I suppose even physically. And so you have a kind of transitivity. A causes B, you know, words cause stress, and B causes C, stress causes physical harm. And so A causes C. And <clears throat> they correctly, in my view, point out that we can certainly say that A causes C in that transitive relationship, but that doesn't necessarily make A itself violence, right? Because you could say, this is their, their example, I'm going to give a lot, you know, a teacher gives a lot of homework. I'm going to give you, says, I'm going to give you a lot of homework tonight. And those words create stress amongst the students. And then the stress, the stress amongst the students, you might say, is harmful. But certainly saying the words, I'm going to give you a lot of homework, cannot be construed as dominant, as, as uh, violence. So I would, the argument being that words by themselves are not violence, at least in my view, in a view of hate and Lukianov. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should just say anything. I and mean, we have hate speech laws for a reason. Um, and this is kind of kind of segueing or segueing um, into where I thought we might end up going, but it's up to you, um, which is that uh, the notion of free, free speech, the question of 
free speech does not strike me as a question of either or that we either have it or we don't. Um, but it's a matter of um, cultivating that stoic wisdom, if you will, to discern when and under what conditions, in what context, um, it is appropriate to engage in quote unquote free speech or just call it free, wh whether or not speech should be freely expressed. Um, you know, I think we can all reasonably imagine circumstances in which uh, it's not appropriate to, you know, say something that is obviously harmful for any number of reasons. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, what I would have to say about that. Uh, do you mind if I jump in here at this point? Um, yeah. Because uh, so Ashley wrote something in the chat, and I think that this is a, a this perfectly fits with the direction the conversation is going. So Ashley says, and I'm. Uh, I don't know if this is necessarily Ashley saying this is his opinion or perhaps provoking us with a, with a thought, but he says dangerous free speech is when people started bleaching their babies to cure them of autism because they found a Facebook group giving them advice about it. So that's, that, that's, that's a, classic, a true incident. That's a true oh, incident. I, so yeah. that's a classic example of um, where one might, that's, that's a real devil's ad advocate sort of scenario there where you could say, Okay, well, certain speech um, uh, can can kind of lead people in the direction of terrible behaviors. Now, you can also give examples of when scientists who should have had the expertise, for example, have created products and told people this is completely safe. And then 10 years later, you see people having babies with deformities and now you've got a huge problem on your hands. So it seems to me like one of the major issues is who do we allow to define what speech is safe and not yeah. and how much power do we give them to do that? Because it, I, it seems to me, and I want your thoughts on this, Jonathan, it seems to me that as soon as you start saying, well, perhaps we can take a little bit of this speech away, you know, you're not allowed to say this a little bit of that. I think that you have to have the assumption when you do that, that humans are not capable of reasoning themselves and that they must be coddled and, and, and that there are certain things that we have to protect them from. And to me, I think that, you know, of course we can all talk about the slippery slope fallacy. I'm going to use it. I, I see that as a very dangerous slope to roll down is when you start saying, well, humans don't have the capacity to actually reason their way through this. There's always going to be two, three, maybe 10% of the population who are going to do wild things based on words that they've heard other people say. Now, do we let that portion of the population make us believe that the entirety of the population must be safeguarded against certain forms of speech? I guess that's my, my question to you. Um, you know, Massimo um, Pigli Pigliucci, I assume he is familiar to everybody here, uh, wrote an article for Aereo last May, in which he was, um, among other issues, raising this, this sort of idea um, in talking about free speech and virtue ethics. Um, and that, uh, I mean, he was kind of giving an over historical overview, talking about the rise of the printed print printing press and efforts to repress that. But now we sort of have um, another problem with social media, which democratizes the dissemination of uh, in information like nothing we've ever seen. And so you have um, examples like that, and, and we can all sort of cite several other examples, particularly in light of our current pandemic. Um, and uh, I understand the, the, the logic, the infinite regress or the slippery slope uh, notion that if you start down the path, you're just gonna slip all the way down and fall into the abyss. And I think what I think of, what comes to mind for me is the notion of the stoic sage. Um, so the issue is not that, um, how do I say that? I mean, we are all, uh, you know, 
so stoicism and its understanding of nature and rationality strikes me as teleological in nature. In other words, we have the potential uh, to be perfectly rational, to to optimize our life, to, to reach our fullest potential uh, in terms of virtue and character and the exercise of reason and so on. But few, if any of us, ever actually per achieve that per state of perfection, right? The rare is a phoenix stoic sage. And so the issue, it's an issue of striving to be as virtuous as we can, or in this particular case, um, rationally uh, or through the exercise of reason arriving at some correct judgment about some aspect of reality, such as I don't know whether you should take a vaccine or something uh, or something like that. Um, but I mean, I think you just have to ex acknowledge. And I mean, I think this is sort of part of I mean, at least for me, stoic comportment, or if you will, is coming to terms with the fact that most, if not all of us are going to be imperfect and just striving to be as wise as possible in terms of, you know, either arguing it out, uh, having a conversation, like the scientific community and peer reviewed publishing and all that, having seminars and so on. Um, what was a quote that I uh, came across in Massimo's um, uh, article that, uh, you know, people exist for the sake of one another, teach them then or bear with them. And so, if you are on the right side of the issue, you either try to teach them or bear with them. He's talking about being with someone, you know, the uncle at the holiday table who insults you or whatever, but you can sort of see how it applies to this. So I guess I just don't have a perfect answer because I'm not a sage. Um, uh, but I don't necessarily think that restrictions on free speech necessarily imply the slippery slope. And I mean, you can think of an obvious example like yelling fire in a theater, right? We, we don't want that to happen. Um, you know, I'll say something controversial right now and maybe I'll get uh, berated for it, but I supported the Twitter ban on Donald Trump. Um, and uh, I think that was a good rational decision on the part of Twitter. Um, uh, so I, I do think that at some point you have to come to a judge judgment about the types or the degree to which you would restrict speech. And that's just a general principle. In each case, it's obviously going to, you know, it's going to be a weigh and consider type of thing. Kai, I don't know if you feel that this is the next appropriate question, but if, if not, I want you to take over. But it seems to me like, um, uh, okay, so I I would probably disagree with you on the issue of banning Trump from from Twitter. I, I thought that that was a, a pretty, um, I, perhaps I haven't thought about it as long as you, but but my my initial response is, I don't like that. Um, so maybe seeing as we're talking about free speech, do you want to run us through your arguments for why you think that that was a reasonable decision? Uh, essentially banning him from Twitter. Well, uh, the basic idea, I suppose, I guess it's sort of a consequentialist type of argument, although I don't know that I'd like to characterize it as at that it, um, uh as such, using that specific word, since we're trying to be virtuous the ethicists in, in a sense. But given the position that he was in, uh, you know, president of the United States and so on, and at least what I take to be the demagoguery of his utterances um, and how he thought about things and how he spoke about things. Um, and the demagoguery, again, in my view, uh, um, uh, to me implies a degree of influence. Um, you know, because a demagogue is a demagogue because he or she has influence, I suppose. I'd have to think through that reasoning there, but he certainly had a lot of influence, which leads then to, uh, and again, I, you know, I, I apologize for being a little controversial, but I think. Um, <laughs> 
it does lead to a certain kind of rise of conspiracy minded movements like QAnon or what led or what happened on January 6th in the US. Um, and I, I mean, I don't want to draw a direct causal connection because these are, these are, you know, these are the types of arguments you have to be careful in making. And I would probably have to write up a very thought out essay trying to lay out the case. I've written some things on Trump in the past and I can refer, refer people to those essays. Um, I mean, in short, I'm not a fan, but I do think that the degree of demagoguery in which he seemed to, into which he shamelessly was engaging had sufficient harmful social consequences that there was no need to give him that kind of platform. Um, and so I suppose it really is a function of the degree of influence that he had and the way that he was not virtuously, um, and that's in my judgment, um, exercising that right of spe free speech, if you will. And I know a lot of people disagree. I have, you know, as a critique, critic of Robin DiAngelo and her work on whiteness studies and white fragility theory and so on, uh, I certainly have um, garnered fans, if you will, from people on the right of center. And I imagine that many of them would disagree with me on this, um, but and again, it's not to sort of toot your horn, horn but I mean, you, you know, Greg Sadler defined, tells us that coverage is about having courage for the right reasons. And, you know, I think I have to just kind of, you know, exact my fortitude in coming to that, that, that conclusion for the right reason, quote unquote, in my view. Um, and by the way, I said on Twitter before this that, you know, I've never blocked or muted anybody on Twitter because I welcome critique. Um, so it's not as if I'm trying to be definitive about this, uh, but at any rate, yeah, I, um, uh, that is the conclusion at which I arise, uh, arrive, uh, um, I mean, Jonathan, well, like, if you think about it from a stern perspective, free speech is an, is, is an indifferent, it's the yeah, way, that's a good know, point. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not, it doesn't follow that free speech per se is just or unjust, right? It's by using reason on a, this is the issue that I have with lack of free speech. All people that form into the category of whatever is the least popular at the moment, right? Cannot speak. Is different to this particular individual in this particular circumstance, because they have done this, because they will continue to do this. I have reason to believe they will continue to do this, should not be allowed to continue to speak in that way is a much more virtue ethics perspective because you're not saying that a category, because in Stoicism, we never talk about categories. In, it's categories of people, so we just talk about categories. Categorization of people is not something that a virtue ethicist would do because they literally do think about an individual, an individual, an individual. Well, yeah. it's an indifferent to, from this point, it's an indifferent in the sense that it, it's not a virtue or a vice, right? So it's, sometimes it's preferred and sometimes it's dispreferred, right? And yeah, as, I mean, I'm... Well, I'm just thinking different. about, yeah, I'm just thinking about this in terms of justice, um, which is the idea, you know, I mean, I, I just very simply think about it as, you know, treating people with respect and dignity, but also more socially or more generally about society in terms of, you know, um, a more just society. And I don't think that, um, that their Donald Trump was advancing the cause, the cause of justice. I think it's uh, um, regressing in that regard. And I think uh, the virtue ethicist or the stoic um, response or uh, path, if you will, is to try to help him cultivate that character to, uh, you know, to, to do what you can um, to teach him, otherwise bear him as I bear it, as I was just quoting Marcus Aurelius. But in this case, I just, you know, what is the probability first that I could ever even get the opportunity to talk to Trump? And even if I had that opportunity, what's the probability that somebody like that is gonna to listen to me? It's very, very infinitesimal, zero. Um, and so, in my case, I arrive at the decision that I think it's just better off if um, he's not allowed that platform. 
Yeah, because you're not keep, banning him for example, you're not banning him per se, like in free speech. He's not saying that's right. I'm not right. saying that he cannot speak at all, right? Because that's, that's what that's happens right. with cancer culture. It's not that you that's can't right. have a Twitter platform, is that you cannot speak. So Correct. um Twitter is interesting anyway, because it's a private space, right? So it's 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 weird in its own in its own way. I would be, I would be, for example, very um careful to say that any an individual should be banned full stop, which is what is happening with cancer culture to remove someone from a platform because they are using it for their own means, which are, you know, 99% of the time, not linked to supporting the cosmopolitan. And I've said this to Santara in other discussions that Stoics were not adverse to certain things if they saw that the cosmopolis as a whole was being damaged by certain actions. Now, if you could, if you could take, you know, this individual and talk to him about cultivating a good character then you could say okay let's see if we can put him back on there it depends if they're interested because if you if you say that no one ever should be banned from banned from speaking on any platform regardless of how they're using it it's also kind of saying well no one should be put in prison right because you're taking away their space you're taking away their freedom of space yeah. so regardless of what they do they should be allowed to roam free right roam free in the sense of being in society but most people feel comforted by the fact that people that are doing a lot of damage to the cosmopolis are behind bars. And everybody behind bars is doing a lot of damage to the cosmopolis. But most people would say that if you are doing a lot of damage to the cosmopolis, then it probably in the 21st century is reasonable that you are removed from society in that so, in that particular way. Not to the degree that we're doing it, that they're no longer people because they lose their personhood in the US, but there is some aspect of removing them from the, the society that they're in for that period of time. I don't know, if Jonathan, if that helps. Yeah, I, so a couple of things. One, I'm generally not a fan of cult, cancel culture. We've written an article, co-written an article about that. Um, one of the biggest problems I have with what we're talking about in terms of whiteness and white privilege and culture wars and all of that is that uh, one bad utterance and somebody ends up being canceled or mobbed or what have you. Um, I can recall, you know, uh, the, the, the I was going to launch into a, an anecdote, but I want to get to the point. Um, the issue is that I am very much about forgiveness, second chances, even third chances. If someone, uh, well, first of all, because people can slip and make mistakes, you know, like we're not sages and all that. And then also when people show that they're will, they're, they're trying to learn, become virtuous, that sort of thing. So I'm actually quite liberal when it comes to people making mistakes. I know I've made a lot of mistakes in life. I cringe about when I think about some of them. And I think uh, I am very much uh, antithetical to the notion of kind of dogmatically uh, uh, exiling people from the discourse. Um, I think that uh, the, the issue with uh, Trump was not just the power of the position, although that was a big part of it. It's just that he really struck me as irredeemable. And I think about Nero. You know, um, Seneca uh, gets criticized because he was, you know, well, you know, he was wealthy, you know, he was currying favor, this to that, you know, for all sorts, to the extent that we're all familiar with the history of Seneca. I, <clears throat> I very much uh, like his writings. I think he's probably my favorite Stoic in terms of his writings. And I understand. Well, um, I grant him more than a few mulligans in the extent to which, uh, you know, he was essentially trying to navigate the world in a very practical way and not trying to be like Epictetus, who just was content to just, you know, be a pauper and teach. It's fine. I mean, people have different ways of going about things. Um, but Nero, let's face it, was irredeemable. I mean, there, there was just nothing that you were, you were not going to get anywhere with him. And I mean, I don't necessarily want to imply I want to you know compare Trump to Nero but the, the issue being that there is a point at which you just have to rationally recognize when a situation you're just not going to make the kind of progress that you want to make and that you do have to take that cosmopolitan perspective into it or that cosmopolis cosmopolis into perspective um and you know, do what you think is in the best interest of the cosmos or the cosmopolis. Or I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. 
Um, so I guess to summarize, yeah, go ahead. Well, to summarize, I'm generally against call cancel culture. I don't like the idea of banning people from Twitter, banning speech, what have you. But I do think that the notion of stoic wisdom does kind of have a context dependent aspect to it, in which you do have to be able to recognize when something like that might be appropriate. So uh, I, I'd like to ask one more question then, Kai, I don't know if, how you feel about this, but maybe we could say, if anybody has a question, please raise your hand. Um, and I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on this, Jonathan, because I think this, this is such an important discussion and uh, I don't pretend to have answers, but I but I do have problems and I, I'm going to throw them out to you. So the, I, I don't lean particularly far right or left uh, at any stage. But one thing that I, well, there's a few things that I consider about the Trump case. Number one, 50% of the country seemed to like the fact that he was there. So that's something to take into account from the start. Um, you, you've also got the issue of if we have reason, perhaps we look ahead and we think, okay, this is one of the largest companies in, in the entire country. It's basically a public square for discussion. And what we're about to do is remove somebody who 50% of the country actually like the fact that he's there. And you might reason from that, that you might be doing more harm than good by taking somebody like that away from the public square. Cause you might think, well, what could happen as a result of that? Well, what you might say is what could happen is what exactly did happen, which is Trump's now starting his own social media platform and he's going to get all those people on there. And now you're going to have a major division between the left and right, even in the sort of platforms that we gather on, which means that people are less likely to be talking to each other. To me, it seems like there is a, somewhat of a, a, a problem in looking ahead here but also, you know, I think that what's so interesting about our current time is, and Scott makes this point, you could take a look at the difference between the response to, say, the Black Lives Matter protests, and I'm not giving you any opinions I have about them. I think that there was some really great stuff and important stuff, but also within those protests, there were riots. You look at the difference between the response from, say, governments and organizations to those protests to say the truckers protest that's just happening now. Look at how heavily the government came down on those truckers protests with very, very little evidence of any sort of rioting or poor behavior. And you see that there is in our, in our world at the moment, there seems to be somewhat of a tilt towards the left in terms of their ability to silence perspectives that they believe are not uh, are not uh, right. And so, uh, and this is a point that Scott made in, in there, just thinking about the differences between how big companies and governments are reacting in their, in their silencing of certain movements. So I wonder what you would, you would say to something like that in the case of um, Trump, how much of our political biases are coming into this and clouding our reason so that we can't see that this might actually divide people more than it brings people together. Yeah, I appreciate the point. Um, and it's actually something that um, I'm sure I've thought about this at various points, uh, and I might think about it now more that you've asked the point. And I, I can't say I have a definitive answer to that because <clears throat> it is a reasonable question. Um, I will say I am also an economist. And so uh, that does come to mind with the idea that, well, there's, you know, particularly in the case of someone like Trump, there isn't necessarily a barrier to entry and that uh, it is possible to develop his own social uh, media company. That said, there are network effects and other things that explain why Twitter continues to remain dominant. And frankly, I'm not sure just how much, uh, how persistent Trump's influence really is. Uh, if he were to run in 2024, I mean, it's just speculation, but I feel like there are candidates that are ready to just take the mantle like Ron DeSantis or somebody. So I'm not necessarily convinced that he does have that 50%, which is more like maybe 40, 45%, by the way. Um, and I'm not so sure that it's so much, I mean, there is a sort of cult of personality there and, and there is something about Trump that stands out or stood out in 2016 relative to other candidates. Um, <clears throat> but he was an expression of something more fundamental, I think, uh, 
things like anti-elitism and, and sort of anti-Washington and anti-globalist -global, perspective, uh, sort of populist, uh, postmodern conservatism, some people call it. Um, and so I don't necessarily have a definitive answer, um, but I don't think his support was as uh, wide as 50%, but even so, I would think that there is a case to be made, I'm making this off the cuff, that that makes it perhaps even more um, important that both we be careful about banning somebody from that platform, but also that if sufficient conditions are met, how important it is to actually in fact ban that person because you're not banning the ability to all of those supporters to continue to engage on Twitter or wherever else to express their views or what have you. Uh, uh, Trump is just a, a voice that sort of brings it together, like the newspaper and they, like they talk, they Tocqueville talks about the newspaper and democracy in America. And so there's just his ability to rhetorically uh, express uh, a converging of, of views, but I'm not necessarily convinced that that's, mis that's a good thing. And that, again, it's a case by case uh, decision. And, and, and sometimes, I mean, you have to, I mean, I'm not comparing Trump to Hitler here, but I'm saying like, if you wanna go to the extreme case, I mean, there's a case to ban Hitler. Uh, there's a case to ban Stalin. There's a case to ban Mussolini. Um, and again, I, I don't, I'm not, I, I actually thought that those comparisons that people drew between Trump and fascism and all that were overdone. Um, and I didn't think that that, that um, analogy really applied. Uh, but in principle, this is just a conceptual point here. I mean, there is a point, a threshold at which I think it is appropriate to uh, not further encourage that aggregation of hostilities to which I think Trump, Trump was contributing. Mm. Well, if if nobody uh, has put up their can hand just, yet, I'm going to assume that nobody has a question yet. Can I just but, answer um, Scott's question, though? Do you mind? Scott has yeah. Scott asked a question. So I think that 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 Simon was clear that the the thing that is unreasonable is that certain individuals, again, the, the people who like to think they're on the right side of history at the moment, which at the moment is leftist, but not the left, haven't had the same scrutiny. But this goes back to a, a statement that Leonidas Konstantikos and I made I agree three with years ago. You agree? Yeah, you, that we made three years ago that this the stoic is not, the allegiance is not to the left or the right. Your allegiance as a stoic is to reason, right? So if I can give enough sufficient reason to suggest why, for example, Donald Trump should be removed from a certain platform, then it stands to reason that I use, should use exactly the same criteria to decide whether I should freeze um, bank accounts to people who donate and go fund me to Canadian truckers. And if I am not doing that, then my allegiance is clear. And it is not to reason. So the issue is not whether one bans Trump or not, if you can provide them a sufficient reason. It is having done that, then that criteria must be the criteria that stands and must, that's the issue. The issue is not that Trump is banned because there are, I think, I think Jonathan has shown a good, you know, provided strong reason as to why that may be useful at the moment. Does it mean he should be banned forever? I don't think Jonathan would advocate that at all. You know, he's made that clear. The problem is that we are seeing a contradiction. We are seeing that aspects of Black Lives, you know, Black Lives Matter aspects were wonderful, and they highlighted to people who had not actually ever thought about anything to do with the race issue, and there were individuals that, who had that problem. They highlighted that. At the same time, there was a lot of tension created in very vulnerable areas, which were predominantly um, Black. And so they weren't actually doing what they said they were doing. So then if I use the same criteria about bring, you know, sort of encouraging certain narratives that sh have shown to be false, that are not based on facts, to, to bring about my, um, my narrative and my ends, then again, then reason dictates that if I use the same criteria, then there are certain aspects of that movement that would, would have to be 
my opinion shut down. Definitely, because I'm using the criteria, if I were the New York Times, the criteria to remove Trump. And I think Judith was nodding, and I think she would she would also say that part of the issue is this double standard. As a Stoic, yeah. we can't stand the double standards. We right. set the criteria, and the criteria is reason. And yes, it is case by case, right? So if a person, for example, if a person says a silly thing age 15, I don't think we should rake them over the coals at 25 years old. I really don't. Even if they were 15 and they said a lot of silly things. I think we should say they were 15, what are they like now? Because Stoics aren't always, once you ban somebody, you always ban somebody. It's what about now? What about now? And only in, say, the Adolf Hitler case where it, it, the, the, the time is not going to make the difference, the teaching is not going to be the difference because he's not reachable, would you then decide in that case to eliminate Hitler, which would not be seen as necessarily, you know, the word murder, because that's unjust killing. You would say, is it justified? So in the case of Nero, could... Was he trying to navigate the world and be, you know, try to, to be virtuous in any way? No, he was literally just doing whatever he felt like. Was Trump doing that in this particular period in his life? I would argue that yes, he had become like that. Does that mean we should have him banned in 2024? I don't necessarily think so, because a stoic, you judge the person uh, in that light. Does that mean that we should remove, remove Black Lives Matters indefinitely or because they did one, you know, two or three things which I thought were un inappropriate and unreasonable? No. Um, but the thing that, that I think is being lost is that loving your tribe is not agreeing with your tribe all the time. It's correcting when they're wrong. Um, sorry, uh, Judith had to go. She had a question. So. Uh, she had Scott, a question. Does, Scott, does yeah. that answer your question? Okay. So I just felt like I was your, it was such a good question, but uh, yeah. Didn't yeah think we had by the way, um, you know, I, I, uh, almost regret mentioning Trump because I don't like to talk about him all that much, but he just was a way of illustrating a point. Um, I certainly didn't want to center any discussions about Trump, but anyway, I just thought I would say that. I was hesitant to ask, sorry, sorry go on. I was hesitant to post my question because I knew that it could very easily be inflammatory. And I was just really curious about your perspective on, on, on that. And, and you've answered that well. So thank you. Uh, Kai or me or Simon or I, well I oh I'm, sorry I'm, I'm just I'm just trying to what, what was oh, that Scott you asking your... Scott who answered it well are you asking are you asking Scott yeah. who answered it well okay yeah exactly. Scott who yeah, answered exactly. it well, <laughs> well uh, Jonathan and Kai both I, I think that both of you uh, in oh, your okay. answer you got okay. to what I was looking for okay, so thank great. you yeah by, so by, by all by all means uh, controversial questions are are always welcome um, I don't issue that in any in any way ashley's got a question now and uh he also posted something uh in the in the comments earlier and i think he's exactly right that part of what i was saying was a a um a, a fallacy of popularity the call to popularity right and and i would certainly align myself with what uh kai has said is that our allegiance should be to reason certainly but i do think that um just one quick thought to throw in here is that it seems to me like we have extremely difficult problems to figure out as human beings, right? We can all agree on that. Okay. Uh, and we have certain tools at our disposal to deal with those problems. We can all agree on that. And then we can look at those tools and we can say, what is the most fundamental, important tool that we have to deal with those problems? To me, it seems like that tool is our speech, dialogue, dialogos, you know, and, and, and using reason in our speech to figure out those problems. And so I think that a lot of what I'm trying to say is not necessarily yes to Trump, no to Trump, yes to people being on here. It's more there's something sacred about freedom of speech because it is the most important and the most useful tool that we have as human beings to deal with any problem. And because there's something so sacred about it, it requires us to be extremely cautious with how we decide to squash or lift up certain speech. And I guess my only major critique of the major uh, social media networks at the moment is I don't think that they're being cautious enough or yeah. far thinking enough in their approach to these things. And many of it seems like they've got like two or three people in a room who just decided that they didn't like something. And so out they go. And to me, that is an absolute uh, uh, misuse of that privilege that they have as people running these major organizations 
and and it's dangerous. So to me, I, I think that there's a bit of flippancy that is happening in our modern times. Yeah, um, yeah I definitely agree with that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I sort of, I know I was cautious, if you will, to use your word, or I was almost hesitant to bring up Trump because I didn't want that issue to sort of um, mislead people into thinking that that I am a censor, if you will, because I'm very far from it. And I think what you just said is is perfectly corresponds with the way I think. Where you know I, uh, you know my 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 one of my biggest critiques of critical social justice, the social social justice movement, and so on, is that urge to stifle speech. Um, and uh, I think that goes on both on the left and the right, even though I agree that the sort of, you know, ironically, in a sense, given the critiques of critical theorists, that the leaders of institutions, cultural, political, media, and so on, are kind of more leftist than rightist. Um, and so I agree with all that. So Essentially, yes. Uh, thank you for saying that. And I just wanted to convey the idea that I pretty much agree with your assessment there. Yeah, and you don't need to apologize for bringing up Trump. I th- like, I think that that's great. I, I think I think because what we, what it does is it brings us into the most visceral example in our modern times. You know, of of when this has started to come through. You've been listening to the Walled Garden Podcast. If you'd like to attend any of our free meetups and events. Or if you'd like to get one-on-one mentoring with either Sharon LaBelle, Kai Whiting, or myself, just go to thewalledgarden.com. But for now, don't forget to nourish those gardens in your mind. Mm-hmm.